Hey everybody, and welcome back to my book club. If you were here from the beginning, you would know that my first ever book talk was on this lovely book over here. There is a reason I am featuring it in the background and it is The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt. That video is now private. I can't even bring myself to rewatch it. I literally filmed that video without a microphone. Also, I recorded it on my front camera. Huge rookie mistake. I finished reading The Secret History several months ago and I have been unable to stop thinking of this book. It's been on my mind. I've had many conversations about it. This book is one of those books. This book is seriously like Infinite Jest and Atlas Shrugged, one of those books that the world is divided into two parts. You either love these books or you hate them with the fire and passion of a thousand suns. I gotta say, I am fanatically obsessed with this book. I kiss the ground that Donna Tartt walks on. I think this book is absolutely fantastic. And despite me being able to say this, I 100% get the criticism behind it. I 100% get you when you say that you think that this is complete pretentious drivel. Vast swathes of this novel had me questioning what I thought of it. But then something magical happened. The second I finished reading it, I just sat there marinating in what I had just read. And I felt the complete and utter sadness of these characters, but in a good way. I can't really put into words the feelings I had upon finishing this book. The best way I can describe the feeling I had finishing this book, rather, is this song or this score that I'm gonna share you down below. It's called On the Nature of Daylight by Max Richter. If you've seen the film Arrival, it's the main song in that movie. That song basically summarizes how I felt. I can't even put it into words. So I suppose that since this book reveals the killer and the person who gets killed on the first page. This is more or less gonna be a non-spoiler video, so if you have not read this book, I'm not gonna be saying anything that you're not gonna discover beyond the first few pages. If you're scared of being spoiled, read the first three pages and then come back and you can watch this whole video pretty much. So The Secret History is about a young man named Richard Tapin who gets an opportunity to study in an elite boarding school in New England. Once there, he finds his way into this eccentric group of students who are all studying Greek under an exclusive, brilliant professor named Julian Morrow. We are told upon the book starting that one of the students in this Greek class named Bunny has died and that his death was planned by and executed by a fellow classmate named Henry. So this humongous story unfurls through 567 pages and we bear witness to the plotting, execution, and aftermath of this murder. So what this does is it casts a shadow of suspense and dread over the rest of the novel because the second the protagonist, Richard, meets this guy named Bunny, we know that he's a dead man. And this book is told in the first person. We are Richard when we read this book. And on the other hand, when we meet Henry, we instantly know that something is up between whatever these guys are doing and that we need to be on our toes. So I wanna talk about the themes of this novel and give you a bit of a thing about why I think the protagonist, Richard Papin, is so significant. But first, I wanna tell you a story. So once upon a time, there was a Greek historian named Procopius. Procopius was a Byzantine scholar and an official historian during the time of Emperor Justinian and his wife Theodora. While the emperor and his wife were alive, he wrote beautiful state-sanctioned things about them. Eventually, Justinian and Theodora died. After their death, it was discovered that Procopius had written about a secret history chronicling what was really going on. This discovery actually contradicted the state-sanctioned history that he had previously written. Instead, it talked about how Justinian was terrible and how Theodora was a whore. So why am I bringing this up? This is crucial because Procopius is to ancient Greece what Richard Papin was to the rich society of high academia. Richard, like Procopius, was an insider look into the lives of the rich and wealthy. So Richard is a guy who grew up in California and lived a standard middle-class life before being admitted to this school. On the surface, this novel is us reading about the lives of these rich, pretentious, academic people taking their postgraduate degree from the perspective of somebody who doesn't really have much of a personality. And through Richard's story, he actually communicates truths about their lifestyle. They are pretentious, indulgent asshats who are so caught up in their lives of philosophizing that their worldview is essentially only limited to first world problems. In my opinion, this book is a mechanism by which we, the readers, are allowed to use Richard as a vessel to explore the world of this college campus. 
Donna Tartt does not judge or moralize in the book. Much of what they do go through is actually left up to our interpretation and our own personal biases. So Donna deliberately makes Richard devoid of any personality because she wants us to inject our own preconceived notions into him as he takes us on this journey with him. So this is, in turn, a journey about the universal consequences of indulging in death, which is seen as morally objectionable behavior. I actually watched an interview with Donna Tartt where she talks about how this coming-of-age protagonist in a novel is so important. She describes it as an age filled with so much possibility and fun. Essentially, it is the age where we come into contact with the world for the first time. It's when we figure out and try to make sense of our role in the world. And we, as Richard, slowly begin to do the same, or at least I did. So this book is told from the first person point of view of Richard. We are essentially Richard when we read the book. And many people have complained that Donna Tartt made Richard really bland. Don't get me wrong, this is totally valid, but I think that this was done with a purpose. I realized this when I took a step back and found out that Richard rarely had any personal opinions of his own, pretty much throughout the entirety of the book. So the reason for this, in my opinion, is because Donna Tartt tries to invite us to put ourselves in the shoes of Richard and observe the story through eyes unclouded by personal judgment that she puts into the character. So because she doesn't judge these characters, essentially, that allows you, as Richard, to come up with your own conclusions about them. So whenever I found myself bored or frustrated or even annoyed at these, you know, rich, privileged, white people, I took a step back and realized that this is perhaps what it must feel like to be in a conversation with this type of person. So as Richard speaking to these people through him, we essentially find out how you can have all the money in the world and still be unsatisfied in life. And this is really when we begin to see shades of Homer and Greek tragedy in general in this novel. For example, in the Iliad, we see great hero Achilles strive for honor and glory, and in the end he gets it, but all this wealth and victory leaves him feeling only temporarily satisfied but ultimately numb. So in a sense, that is what being in Richard's shoes felt like. We spend so much time around these characters that we essentially get acclimatized to the way they rationalize things in the context of the story. So for instance, when we get to be alone with Bunny for the first time, we get to see why he is just so damn unlikable and why anyone would want him dead. And as a matter of fact, when Bunny does die, we sort of get a sense that the characters surrounding us, and even Richard perhaps, by extension us, empathize with why his killing was justified. We get an understanding of why they chose to do this, regardless of how little sense it made. And this, in addition to feeling nothing for him, we also feel the feeling of the rest of the group. And in the long stretch of story that follows this, when the detectives are investigating Bunny's death, we feel the collective paranoia that law enforcement might end up catching up with us. <laughs> so when I was starting to think that this book was getting dull, I thought back and recalled when particular scenes had me on the verge of dozing off. And these scenes were definitely ones wherein we were stuck in Francis's house, listening to drawn out conversations of these guys trying to intellectually one up each other. And trust me, these guys talk like such pretentious blowhards, it gets pretty friggin' comical at times. But despite how inaccessible they are, Donna is really able to let us in on this collective despondency that we feel in the aftermath of the murder. It is really a tough balancing act. She's able to depict these rich elites as supernatural demigods, yet simultaneously show that they bleed red like any human being when forced to face themselves. So being in Richard's shoes as the linear story plays out in his recollection of it really allows you to see the story as a stage where moral problems are played out in real time. So with that, you sort of get to stand alongside the characters as their motivations and true intentions start to materialize. And it really makes sense that the POV is in the first person, because if the narrator was omniscient, then the opportunity to uncover mysteries behind the perception and worldview of each character would be taken from us. In this interview Donna Tartt gave, and she has barely given any interviews, she was asked why she chose to have the protagonist be male. And her response was actually incredible. I'm gonna paraphrase it. Basically, she said that the reason the protagonist was male is because this made it easier for the rest of the characters to show them their real selves, especially because most of the characters were male and there was like only one girl in the entire squad, friendship squad of theirs. For instance, when Richard went out to eat with Bunny for the first time and Bunny was saying like super homophobic stuff about the waiter, had the protagonist been a woman, 
I feel like Bunny would have likely been trying to impress her and he would have been less honest with his crass comment being said under his breath. So in short, the, you wouldn't have seen the people as clearly as you did if the POV was a woman. When she said this, I was just mind blown. So another thing I wanna discuss as it relates to this book is the concept of groupthink. So groupthink is a psychological phenomenon where the consensus of the group is given more priority than the individual action. So this was a term developed by psychologist Irving Janus in 1972, and this in turn was inspired by George Orwell's Double Think in the novel 1984, which is when you are essentially told to accept two contradicting ideas at the same time, regardless of the fact that they contradict each other. This is normally how groupthink goes. So nowadays, groupthink is something you see on social media, something you see on mobs, something you see in cults, cancel culture, stuff like that. One of the characteristics of groupthink is unquestioned beliefs. So unquestioned beliefs leads members of the group to ignore possible moral problems and the real life consequences of the group's actions. And people who think in groups often have exaggerated or stereotypical views of their enemies and generally avoid deviating from the group's consensus. One of the most crucial aspects of groupthink is the illusion of unanimity. And this is where dissent by members of the group is discouraged and may even lead to expulsion from the group. So when you question the rationale of the group, that leads to your loyalty to the group being questioned by both the group and your inner self. So in an interview I watched of Donna Tartt, she spoke about how each person in the group had their own reason for wanting Bunny to die. So these characters live in their own tiny bubble where the opinions of others are seen as invalid or less than. So pretty much all the evidence in this story shows that each central character derives their energy from the tiny group. As a matter of fact, if you look closely and read closely at the rationale behind Bunny's murder, you'll see that the common denominator was a messianic goal, especially on Henry's part. The promise of instant gratification, consequences be damned, and a very easy solution to a complicated question because Bunny was threatening them and they felt that silencing him ultimately would bring them peace of mind, which did not happen. And at the center of it all are a group of characters whose morals are warped because of their inability to be separated from the group. And in addition to that, because of their inability to separate appearance from reality. I'd even go as far as to say that the character of Richard is so ashamed of himself. He is so anxious to become part of this group. And a lot of his anxiety comes from the fact that he would never be accepted or seen as part of their cohesive unit that was established before him coming to the school. And pretty much all his actions, despite the fact that he's a pretty blank slate as a character, conveys that he seeks the approval of those in the group, regardless of their shallow worldview and compromised morals. So the scene that really underscores this to me is the long stretch in which they spend time in Bunny's family home, as his family is about to bury him, as they're about to bury their own son. So before this long scene, Bunny felt more like an idea. However, upon meeting his family, we begin to actually see Bunny as a person. And when we begin to see his humanity materialize in front of our very eyes, we also see it register in the hearts and minds of the people around us. So this is when the truest sense of regret begins to emerge. Now I find it really interesting that these guys study classics and ancient Greek this, in my opinion, was not an accident. The reason I say this is because having read Homer's The Iliad for school, I can confirm that manifestations of groupthink existed in ancient Greece as well. We learn that the lives of people in ancient Greece revolved around a thirst for power and glory. And attitudes like these were widely accepted cultural norms which neglected the intrinsic dignity in every man. And you see this in the book's protagonist, Achilles. Achilles satisfies his thirst for power and glory when he kills Hector. And this retribution on his part feels good temporarily, but it doesn't mean anything because the feeling of joy is fleeting. So Homer in the Iliad argues that the culture in ancient Greece saw people as dispensable and that the people in ancient Greece were incapable of seeing other people as an I, an I, a letter I, not as a, you know, <laughs> or as a subject 
and end in themselves. In other words, the culture of ancient Greece was incapable of perceiving human dignity. This thirst for power and glory is a false good, meaning it feels good in the moment, but it won't make you truly feel fulfilled. And this can be seen in other examples of literature, my favorite example being The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald and Jay Gatsby's pursuit of tunnel vision for the American dream pretty much explores this theme also, and better than the Iliad, in my opinion. In the Iliad, Achilles doesn't find true happiness until he gives the body of Hector back to Hector's father, Priam. So this scene conveys that he has managed to rise above the cultural norms and has rediscovered his humanity. The book ends with Achilles and Priam, two of the strongest men in ancient Greece, crying over the blood that they and their enemies shed in the name of power and glory. Unlike the Iliad, the secret history is set in a real world. There are no Greek gods. Even though Donatar does try to portray the main characters here as people who see themselves as Greek gods, in the end, they're just people. This book also reminded me a lot of Dostoevsky. It reminded me of the book Crime and Punishment, and Crime and Punishment is set in Russia, where everybody is sad and poor and desperate. So similar to The Secret History, Crime and Punishment happens to be based on a philosophy that the main character, Raskolnikov, has invented. However, the main character in this book does not remind me of Raskolnikov. The person who reminds me of Raskolnikov is Henry. So Henry is the Dostoevsky character in this book, and Richard is, I think, the Dickens character, in my opinion. So Raskolnikov's philosophy, to put it briefly, states that some men are inherently better than other men, and that those who are better have the right to not abide by the laws put forth by lesser men. So regarding the character of Raskolnikov, he actually reminds me so much of the character of Henry because the contrast that the secret history has set in rich society, while crime and punishment is set in impoverished Russia, makes it similar because Henry's big flaw was the fact that he thought of himself as someone whose intentions gave him the right to step across the legal moral limits of a civilized society. Henry and Raskolnikov are basically the kinds of literary characters that live by the philosophy that the end justifies the means. Very Machiavellian. <laughs> so the characters in The Secret History end up having to come face to face with the consequences of what they have chosen to do. And unlike the Iliad, which ended on a bittersweet note of redemption, the characters in The Secret History are only afforded guilt all for their false good that I think, honestly, was a manifestation of their boredom. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to see more long-form videos like this on specific books, I have one on I'm Thinking of Ending Things and Tender is the Flesh by Augustina Bastarica. If you have any ideas of books that I should do videos like this on, like deep dive analysis videos, then the comment section is yours. But until then, thank you so much for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe. I hope to see you in future videos, but until then, take care.